Well, good morning, Walden Church. My name is David Kenny, and I am the pastor here in Montgomery, Texas. And I hope you had a great 4th of July. Hope you had a great uh, Independence Day weekend. We are back doing our sermon series this summer on the Sermon on the Mount. We are looking at the word reset. We feel like the, you know, the world was out of place where people were kind of set in their ways. They were doing their thing. They thought they were doing their walk with God, their theology the right way. Jesus came down, he spoke on the mountain, and he reset how everyone thought. He reset faith, and he gave us new examples and new definitions. And today, I want to talk a little bit about prayer. I want to start by asking, do you think you've ever prayed to God for something silly? <laughs> do you think you've prayed for something silly like, uh, I don't know, a, a home run, right? You're up there at the plate, and you're praying to God, God, just, just once, I want to hit a home run. Uh, what about a raise? And you're like, well, Pastor David, a raise isn't, isn't silly. I, I, I don't know, but have you ever prayed for a raise? What about you ask your son or daughter's team to win the game? Like You're in the stands. You're not even at bat. And you're praying for your little four-year-old's baseball game. What about to win any competition? Or to do good on a test? Or to come in first place or to win the lottery. Maybe get a closer parking space. God, I just want a parking space that's up close. I don't want to walk very far to the store. Do you think we pray for those things and at the same time think to ourselves, this is kind of silly? Or maybe do you think we pray those things but when we come together in church or we come together in Bible study or maybe we're going around the room and we're sharing our prayer requests, when it gets to be our turn, we say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm fine, I'm good. Because secretly, we think our prayers are silly. That would be funny if, you know, when you were going around the room and people were saying, how can we pray for you? How can we pray for you? When it came to you, you said, you can pray that I'd win the lottery. Why do we think... It's silly to pray for some things, especially things that we want, especially things for ourselves. Or why do we think only some prayers are silly? Oh, because isn't there some passage in the Bible about only praying for things that bring God glory, or we should only pray for things that uh, bring about God's will? God doesn't listen to the, the silly prayers, does he? I don't know, is that what we think? Or maybe we'll ask for the wrong thing. You know, I'm gonna pray for one thing, but perhaps to teach me a lesson, or because I left some particular thing out, God's gonna answer my prayer, but not in the way I'd expect. Ah, it, it's a trick. Is that how prayer works? I mean, maybe I just hedge my bets then, and I've just learned not to ask God for a lot of things. That way, I won't be disappointed. This summer, we're reading the Sermon on the Mount because we see a lot of these same ideas even back in Jesus' day. So Jesus took this opportunity to preach on all these things that we need to reset our mind on. Maybe my needs and the things that I want, the things I ask for, aren't really so silly. Maybe I just need to reset how I ask, or reset how I think about prayer. Reset what I think prayer is, and reset maybe how often I pray. How often do you pray? Maybe once a day. You know, I try not to ask God for too much, because I, I mean, I know he's busy. I know there are a lot of people that have bigger needs than me, and I, I really don't want to bother him with my silly prayers. I don't want to bother God. Listen to this parable that Jesus tells. In Luke 18, he says, Jesus told them a parable to the effect that they ought to always pray and not lose heart. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man, and there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, Yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice, so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, 
Hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Doesn't that seem like Jesus is saying, ask, 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 ask repeatedly, over and over. The woman in the in this story, she keeps coming. And the Bible says that the judge gives in because of her repetitiveness. The judge even goes so far as to say the women, the widow was bothering him, right? And yet it says, because this woman is bothering me, I will give her justice. You don't want to bother God? <laughs> Jesus says, when you pray, pray so often, it feels like you're bothering God. John 15, 16 says, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Is that crazy? Does that seem like it's too good to be true? You know, we were always taught not to bother God. But our reset from Jesus is the exact opposite. People knock on my office door and they'll say, hey, I know you're busy. I don't want to bother you. And I'm thinking to myself, I am not busy. <laughs> you are not bothering me. This is my job. You are supposed to bother me. Come by the office, send me an email, call me on the phone, call me at two in the morning. You are supposed to bother me. So bother God. Bother God. It's his job to listen. It's his job to take care of you. You're worried about praying too much. It's God's job to answer prayer. John 14, 14 says, if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. God's job is to supply your needs. Just like Paul says in Philippians 4, my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Ah, but we still know there's a caveat, right? We still know there's a trick to prayer. There's a, there's a subclause. There's a footnote. We can pray and pray and pray, but we have to pray for the things that glorify God, right? Because we can ask for the wrong things. James 4 says, you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. See, this is why I'm never going to win the lottery, <laughs> right? Because I'm going to spend it on my passions. Well, let's look at our text today from the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus would like to push the reset button on how you think about your needs. Matthew 7 says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. Or which of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, would you give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good gifts to those who ask of him? Jesus gives us three simple instructions when it comes to our needs. Ask, seek, knock, right? But maybe they're so simple, we still don't know what to do. We're supposed to ask. Okay, how? Matthew 21 says, whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. So there's more to the asking. We have to learn to ask in faith. We have to learn to ask in faith. What does that mean? That means I have to believe God can do the thing that I'm asking him to do, right? Can God answer this prayer? Can God come through for me on this one? Ephesians 3 says, Now to him who is able to far do more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us. Yes, he can come through. And he can do more than we think. So we have to ask. And we can't doubt. We can't lack faith. Mark 11 says, Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it'll be yours. Wow, that, that is faith. Right? That would be faith. That means you're praying, you're asking for something, and while you're asking, you're thinking to yourself, God's already done it. Even before I started talking, God is... God is faster than Amazon Prime. 
Believe that you have already received it. He mails your answer before you even place your order. But that's not how we typically ask. We hedge our bets, so we ask for less. We don't seek, we don't knock, because we're afraid of God not coming through for us. James 1 says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. James says, God is just like your earthly father. He wants to take care of you, just like any dad. Dads give generously. Dad, can I have $10? Dad reaches into his wallet, and he gives you $20. Dad wants to give you above and beyond. Dad wants to solve the problem. Dad wants to fix the problem so much that it never returns for you. Look at what Hebrew says about ask, seek, knock. Hebrews says, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Our Heavenly Father rewards. He is capable. He can. He will. He gives generously and he rewards. The Bible says God is generous and that God wants you to bug him. Don't you want your kids to come to you more? I mean, you're proud of their independence, of course. But there comes a time when you'd wish they would call on you more. Reach out more. Ask for more. And you say, you know, anytime you need me, I'm here for you. I'm here for you if you need me. We need to ask in faith. So ask and seek. How? How do we seek? 1 John 5 says, And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of him. We have to learn to seek his will. That's always the caveat, isn't it? And sometimes this is what keeps us from asking We think, okay, but what if I ask for the wrong thing? What about that old adage, ah, be careful what you ask for? Or maybe once you heard someone say, oh, don't pray for patience, because God will teach you patience. Like God's just up there waiting to trick you. Seeking means that we take risks. It means exploring. It, It means looking, even if we're not sure. This is why Jesus says, or which one of you, if his son asks for bread, would you give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, would you give him a serpent? That seems really random, right? That seems like a random thing for Jesus to say. Why did Jesus say that? Well, because Middle Eastern bread is round like a ball and it's cooked over a flame. So it kind of looks a lot like a rock. And then there's fish that look like this. Those kind of look like snakes. Jesus assures us, doesn't he? He says, don't worry. He says, you can ask for the wrong thing, but God won't give you the wrong thing. But what if I ask for something that's not his will? That's okay too. I think in those cases, he doesn't say no to punish you. Rather, I think he uses those moments to just reveal what his will is. True, I may not know what God's will is, but that shouldn't keep me from praying. Rather, it should encourage me to pray so that I know what God's will is. Ask, seek, knock. How do you knock? Well, we know how to knock, right? So maybe the better question is, why? Why do you knock on doors? Isn't it because you want to see a person? We knock so that the door will be opened. If we knock on the door, God will open it. In fact, in Revelation chapter 3, it says that Jesus is on the other side of that same door, and he is also knocking. Revelation 3 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. He wants to see you. We knock because we want to see Jesus. We want to be with Jesus. Our prayer life isn't just to ask for things and to receive 
the generous gifts, but it's also so that we have a relationship with Jesus. The door opens and we are with Jesus. Jesus says, I'll open the door or you could open the door. You open the door and then I'll be with you. Prayer is drawing near to God. We are not standing on the opposite side of the door and we're just yelling through it. We're knocking, hoping that any barrier that exists between us are broken down so that we and God can be together. And I know there's all kinds of unknowns still about prayer. And we're always worried about what we pray for. And we're always worried about knowing the will of God. We don't like unanswered prayer. But I think a lot of those worries would just fall away if we just treat this as asking and knocking. I mean, personally, I think Jesus kind of blew it on this analogy, right? Or at least it's out of order. Shouldn't it be that we seek first, right? We'll we'll seek the door, and then we find the door, and then we knock on the door, and then the door is opened, and then we ask, right? Shouldn't it be seek, knock, ask, right? It should be seek, knock, ask. Why is it ask, seek, knock? I mean, if you ask and you receive, why would you ever seek or knock? Or if you seek and you end up finding something, why would you ever go and knock? This is all one sentence and it has commas. I think it should be three conditions, three separate complete sentences so that you isolate all the differences one from the other. But you know what? Jesus didn't make a mistake. Sometimes all you have to do is ask God for something, and that's it, and he'll answer. He'll answer that prayer right then. So you're right. That wasn't too hard. There's no need to keep praying. Sometimes all we have to do is ask. Sometimes the prayer and the answer is that simple. But other times, maybe you ask God for something and you don't receive it. And if God is not answering your prayer the first time around, Then, like the persistent widow, you turn the dial up and you ask and ask and ask. But asking leads to seeking, seeking the answer. Does God want more from me? Does God want less from me? Do I need more faith? Do I need more confidence? Do I need to seek God's answer? What is God's will on this subject? A silent answer from God pushes me to seek his will. And let's say I find it. I find the place where God is. Then what? Well, then I knock. Knocking is an action that pushes me even closer to God. Because I can ask over the phone, right? I can ask you from across the room. I can send an email or I can shout. But to knock, I have to get up close. I have to expect that I'm going to see God's face. You see, knocking takes me to intimacy and it forces me to be in relationship. I have to ask myself with my needs, the things I ask for, what do I want the most? Is it all the stuff that I'm asking for? Do I really really want this home run the most? Or do I want God the most? I mean, the reason why I haven't won a million dollars from the lottery is maybe because God knows the kind of person I am. And if I were to win the lottery, I would love the money and probably love God less. More than asking, more than praying, Jesus asks that we pursue a relationship with him. In one of his most popular teachings on that relationship, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Now we read that, and most of us, we're not master gardeners, right? Nor do we use the word abide in our day-to-day vocabulary, but abide means stay. Stay. Stay with who? Stay with Jesus. Listen, if I were starving, 
I mean, completely starving, running on empty, starving. No food, desperate, and I was lost. And I came upon a restaurant. You know what I would do? I would stay, <laughs> right? I would, I would wait. However long they asked, if they said, sir, there's a 20 minute wait, I would wait. If they said, sit right here, I would sit right there. I would sit wherever they told me. I wouldn't complain about the air conditioning. I wouldn't complain about the music or whether I could hear the cooks that were arguing in the kitchen or I wouldn't complain about the crying baby sitting next to me. In fact, I wouldn't even complain when the waiter came back and said, sir, the kitchen is empty and all we have to eat is green beans. You can't scare me off. I am abiding. <laughs> I am going to stay. I'm going to stay where the food is. Abide means we stay where Jesus is. If a church is preaching Jesus, that's where I want to be. There's no music, there's no decor, there's nothing that's going to scare me off. Abide means stay in Jesus. Abide means listen to Jesus. Abide means connection. It means knocking. It means that door opens and Jesus is my friend. Abide means persistency. In other words, don't quit. Keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking, Keep bugging God. Quitters don't abide. Matthew 24 says the one who endures to the end will be saved. What happens to the one who quits? See ya. <laughs> Hasta la vista. John 15 says if anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. When you don't abide, it means you quit. To not abide, the Bible says, means fire. The vine will be trimmed and tossed, and that part of the plant is now useless. Why is it cut? Because it won't produce fruit. So what good is it? Make room for a branch that will produce fruit. Now, is that done out of hate? Is that done out of punishment? No, of course not. See, sometimes we pray, and we ask for something, and we don't get the answer, and we think to ourselves, God didn't answer me because he is punishing me. No. A lot of times, it's just pruning. And pruning is an act of love. If I see a withered branch or a branch that's hurting the vine, I cut it off because I hate it? No. I'm not punishing the plant. No, because I love it. I want to nurture it. I want what's best for it. I want it to grow. I want it to be beautiful. True, my, my ask might not have been God's will. But it's never a trick. It's not a punishment when God doesn't answer. Even when God disciplines us, it's still done in love. Proverbs 3 says, For the Lord reproves him whom he loves, as a father, the son in whom he delights. Pruning is a temporary setback, but it produces a much better harvest. And pruning, or the fear of pruning, should not keep us from prayer. It should not keep us from asking. It should not keep us from seeking. It should not keep us from knocking. Jesus says that we should be asking daily for what? What does Jesus say that we should ask for daily? Bread, right? Jesus, is tell, Jesus tells us to pray that God would give us our daily bread. You know, over the years, pastors have come up with all kinds of things that Jesus supposedly meant by that. What is the daily bread? Well, do you know what Jesus meant when he said bread? He meant bread. <laughs> Why? Why bread? Well, because bread is a staple of life. The main part of the meal back in Jesus' day was bread. And ours too, right? When you sit down to a restaurant, and what's the first thing the waiter brings you? Chips and salsa. No, oh, well, yeah, true. But I mean, anywhere else in the world, anywhere else in the world, uh, the waiter brings you bread. Bread is a need. It's a daily necessity. Jesus didn't say, give us this day our daily steak right? He wasn't telling us to ask for our desires. He wasn't telling us to ask for our daily wish list. 
He wasn't telling us to come up with our best bucket list or to sit on God's lap and, and read out you know, our Christmas wishes. Jesus was telling us to ask God to supply our needs. And we are able to do that when we ask and seek and knock. And when he opens the door and we have that relationship, then we're dialoguing and he knows our life and we know his will. And because we're in tune with that will and we're abiding with him and he with us, then the conversation just flows so easily. So the bigger question is, what does the bread represent? What are your needs? Well, it's got to be the staples, right? It's got to be uh, food and family and shelter, right? Those are my needs. Of course, those are the things that we should pray about. But are those your deepest needs? Is shelter your deepest need? I mean, Jesus was homeless. If shelter was our deepest need, would Jesus have told his disciples, foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head? Maybe it's family. No. If our families were our deepest need, then Jesus wouldn't have said to Peter, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God, who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come eternal life. Or would he not have told the story in Luke, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me say farewell to those in my home. And Jesus said, no one puts his hand to the plow and looks back and they are fit for the kingdom of God. So if shelter isn't our biggest need and family isn't our biggest need, then it's gotta be food, right? I mean, there's nothing more basic than food. I mean, maybe bread just means bread. Nope, still no. Because if it were, Jesus wouldn't have gone 40 days without it. He wouldn't have given us instructions about how we are to fast. First Corinthians eight says food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat it, no better off if we do. Family is not our biggest need. Shelter is not our biggest need. Food is not our biggest need. Yes, you can pray for those things because they are needs, but they aren't our biggest need. So what is? John 6, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Your biggest need is the bread of life. Your biggest need is the food of doing God's will. John 6 says, do not labor for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you, for on him God the Father has set his seal. See, very early on in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus teaches, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Ask, seek, knock, and the door will be opened to your biggest need. Your biggest need is Jesus. You need him every single day. He is the frequency of your need. You can't live even one moment without his sustaining power and grace. He is the urgency of your need. Abide. Stay close to him. Jesus is the only one who can fulfill you. Food can't. Shelter can't. Family can't. Money can't. Prosperity can't. The only one who can fill every single one of your needs is Jesus. He is the supplier of all your needs. Have you asked him today? Have you asked for your daily bread today? Jesus, give me this day and every day to follow the only bread I truly need. Jesus, give me you. Have you prayed that this morning? Will you pray that? Be like the persistent widow and bug God. Abide in him. Never stop asking, never stop seeking, never stop knocking. Let's pray together. Lord, this is where we need to be more. I need to be here in prayer with you. I need to be on my knees. I need to be pausing and taking these moments, asking, seeking, knocking. In a world that teaches me to find answers on my phone, find answers on the internet, find answers in magazines or advertisements, Lord, you have the answers. 
You have the answers to life. And it's your will that I would receive all the blessings that you have to give because like a gracious and generous father, you want to take care of your children. Lord, may we come here more. May we come on our knees more, asking, seeking, knocking. I want to abide in you, stay close to you each and every day. I want to learn to love you more. Lord, thank you for this time to break open your word, to listen to your voice, to know your will, to hear your instruction, that we might follow you each and every day more closely, love you more dearly. Lord, we ask that you watch over us this week, that you keep us close, not now in these just few hours of church, but that you would be with us each and every day, every moment, abiding the two of us together in relationship, the door opened wide, the relationship extended, love flowing, conversation going, grace giving, peace enjoying. Amen. Hey, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for watching. I hope if you've liked this video uh, that you give us a like down below. You can also subscribe to this channel so that you can stay up to date on the latest happenings with Walden Church, or you can copy that URL up at the top and post it to your own social media wall to let your friends know what you watched this morning. Thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you time next week. Bye.